This is what I want to talk to you today. What happens to a person when he or she dies? Now you see, if there would be an answer to this very question, would you be happy about it? If you would receive a satisfactory answer, not only which would calm your head, but which would calm your heart, would you want this kind of answer? An answer which gives you a, set, a simple, not perhaps a simple, but gives you an explanation of what happens to a person when he dies. You know, today there is a rise of spiritualism. There is a rise of people believing in the afterlife, but not only in the afterlife, in the spiritual world. People believing in ghosts, people believing in spirits, people believing in communicating with the spirits. And these movies from Hollywood are making this a normal thing, that it is okay, it is normal to communicate with the spirit world, whether that is Harry Potter or Twilight or The Sixth Sense, and I could give you many other movies and documentaries and, and, and series, it truly is our culture is wanting an answer. They want an explanation. And the question is, can we know is there, if there is life after death? Would you want to have life after death? It depends on what that life is. But what if that life is beautiful? What if that life is full of peace? What if that life is full of perfection without evil and any other thing? What if there is life after death? You know, in the book of Job, chapter 14, verse 14, many thousands of years ago, the biblical book of Job asked a question which has been in every heart of every human being. The question that Job asked was the following, if a man die, shall he live again? Have you ever had that question? If a man die, shall he live again? Yes? Yes? Oh, very good. As we are going to discover, the Bible clearly says that there is not only this life, but the life to come. But there are so many understandings of what that life to come means. You see, for some people, it means that when you die, you go directly to heaven. Or, if you have been a bad person, you go to a very, very hot place, and I'm not speaking about Australia. I'm speaking about a more, more hotter place than that. Some people mean that when you die, you are going to get reincarnated. In other words, you have been a good person now, you are now going to become an even better person in the next life. But if you have been a bad person in this life, then maybe you are going to become a wolf, or maybe you are going to become a donkey, or, or maybe you are going to become a bacteria. Who knows? Each of these religions compose in and of themselves that there is life after death. But also, our culture, unfortunately, the European culture em has embraced atheism, which means that there is no God, there is no supernatural things, there is no spirituality, and there is no life after death. There's only this life. Now, before we continue, I want to say this. There are many people who live as atheists. But there are few people who die as atheists. If you know what I mean. When you really think through that you are going to cease to exist at your death, people don't want that. 
And that's why there are so many people who, at their deathbed, are converting. Because they realize they don't want to cease to exist. And so, they make a change. If a man shall die, shall he live again? That's our question. So, what book should we turn to in order to get an explanation? My understanding has been that the Bible has stood the test of time. And the Bible gives satisfactory explanations about the topic of death and the topic of life. The greatest mystery of the ages is what happens when a person dies. Let me take you to a beautiful world. Let me take you to a world without sin. Let me take you to a world without death. Let me take you to Eden. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The Bible tells us that when God created the world, there was no death. There was only light. What makes this so amazing is that God is not the cause of death. God is not the creator of death. God is the creator of life. What do you say? God is not the one who has brought death into the world, but humanity who chose to disobey God Death came into our world as a consequence. And so what that means, my friends, that if, if, if God is the creator of life, then death is creation in reverse. Let me say that again. Death is creation in reverse. This is fundamental for our understanding of what life is and what death is is in Genesis chapter 2 verse two, chapter 2 verse 7 the Bible tells us how did we get here in the first place the Bible says and the Lord God formed man out of the what dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul now let me ask you, what are those two compositions which are needed for a life to exist in a human being? You need to have dust, the dust of the ground, the human body, but what is that second thing which you need in order to have a living being? What is that second thing? The breath of life. Can you see that? The Bible says, when you have the human body, together with the breath of life, it is only then that you have human existence. In other words, please notice my friends, the Bible says, God did not put a soul into Adam, but Adam became a living soul. Did you notice that? Let us go back. The Bible says, you have the dust of the ground, you breathe into the nostril the breath of life, and the Bible says, man became a living soul. What that means is that you and I, we don't have a soul, we are souls. Now, I understand that this can be a little bit confusing. Because probably most of our lives we have thought that we have a soul and when we die that soul is going to exist without the body. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says when you have the body together with the Spirit of God then you have a soul. Then you are, rather, see, I'm so still in this thinking. You become a living soul. What happened when Adam died? Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. The Bible says, In the sweat of thy face, God says, 
shalt thou eat bread. Till thou, what is the next word? Return unto the ground. Why return unto the ground? Because that's where he came from. Return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for thus thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. So in other words, when you and I die, we go back to where we came from, and then we cease to exist. The Bible says clearly in what happens at death, we are told in the book Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 7, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. This is the book Predikaren in Swedish. So here the Bible tells us, the body goes back to where it was, but the Spirit came from God. Now don't misunderstand this. This is so significant, my friends. This Spirit is not a thinking entity. Let me say that again. The spirit we cut from God is not a conscious being. It is only when we have the body and the spirit which we receive from God, it is only then that we become a living soul. We do not have a soul. We are souls. Does that make sense so far? Do you see that from Scripture? Do you see these two com compositions that are needed? Very good. Now, let's take an example. An example which you and I can all understand. Let us take a look at electricity. What do you need to have in order to have electricity? You need to have a light bulb and then you need to have power and then together with these two compositions you have electricity or we could even take the our example from a computer what are those two things you need in order to for the computer to exist to, to, to exist or to work you need to have a hardware which is that thing that you are now able to see but you see a hardware without a what yeah exactly a hardware without a software does not exist you need to have an operational system for the computer to work that's what is so beautiful that when these two things are combined with the power into it it can really work the hardware is the body. The software is that thing which God keeps us alive. Go with me to the book of Ephesians in your Bibles, to chapter 4, verse 23. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. It's a rather short uh, Bible verse. And the Bible says, And be renewed in the spirit of your, what? Mind. You see, this spirit which God gives, once again, it's not a conscious spirit entity it does not think for itself it need to have the body and the spirit in order to be a living existence nevertheless the spirit which returns to god we are told in the book job chapter 27 verse 3 that all the while my breath is in me and the spirit of god is in my nostrils that is the breath which god gave me. In the New Testament we saw that it's the spirit of your mind which is being renewed. It's nothing else than the character. It is your character which you have formed which goes back to God. Isn't that amazing? 
your character, the one that you have created during this life, every single day choosing good or wrong, good or wrong, truth or error, truth or lies, that character is being built up. And that character which you have created at death, it goes back to God. However, at the resurrection, God gives you back the correct character you have formed in this life. Do you think it's important to care about our character? Oh, it's very important. Because it is the character which we will receive at the resurrection. It is our thoughts which we will have. The thoughts that you have developed in this life are the thoughts you are going to receive also at the resurrection. If your thoughts are immersed in heavenly reality, at the resurrection, your thoughts will also be immersed in heavenly realities. That's why, my brothers and sisters, it is so important to take care of the mind. The word spirit in the Hebrew is the word ruach. It is used in the King James Bible 377 times. And it is translated either as wind, or air, or it is translated as breath, or it is translated as spirit. There you go. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, then the dust shall return to earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Let me remind you once again, this spirit is not conscious in and of itself. The spirit and the body is needed for consciousness to exist. The spirit that goes back to God is not a conscious thinking entity. Now what about the Egyptians and what about the Bible? You see, the Egyptians believe that the soul was immortal. They, that, that's why they believe that when they died, they were at their death going into the afterlife to present whatever gifts to Osiris, the god of death. What we need to ask now, and we need to be very careful in how we answer this, what does the Bible say about the soul? Is the soul immortal or is the soul mortal? What do we mean by mortal? That it is capable to what? Die. It is capable to cease to exist. Come with me to scripture. The Bible says in the book Ezekiel chapter 18 Verse 4, the Bible says, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. Take a look at this. The soul that sinneth, it shall what? Die. So according to the Bible, can a soul die? It can die. Now why? Because the Bible defines the soul as being our entire being. Because the Bible describes the soul as being the body and the spirit which becomes a living soul. So we could say, the living being that sinneth, it shall what? Die. So the Bible, we could give so many examples from scripture that according to the Bible, the soul can indeed die. Then let me ask you this, if the soul can die, is it mortal or immortal? It's mortal, because only something is immortal that cannot die. But if something can die, then it is mortal. It is able to cease to exist. According to scripture, the soul is mortal. In the King James Bible, the word soul is used about 460 times, but never once uses the term immortal soul. It is only using 
that God is immortal. It only uses that God is immortal. But it never says that you and I are immortal. In your Bible, go with me to 1 Timothy in the New Testament. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 17. Speaking about God here. And take a look at how God is described. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So the Bible says that who is immortal? God is immortal. But when it comes to human beings, the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So only God is immortal, and human beings are mortal. Take a look at this. A Roman Catholic theologian at St. Ambrose College said, there is no such phrase in scripture as immortal soul or immortality of the soul, or its equivalent. There is only the promise of immortality. Isn't that amazing? That is exactly what the Bible says. And we thank the Lord that this Roman Catholic theologian has seen that we don't have an immortal soul, but there is only the promise of immortality given to human beings. Actually, the Bible tells us, if you go with me to 2 Timothy, so we go just one book in the Bible, 2 Timothy, chapter 1, and we're going to read verses one, uh, chapter 1, verse 10. The Bible says in ch chapter 1, verse 10 in 2 Timothy, that... Jesus has now been revealed that by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who has abolished death and brought life and what is that word? Immortality to light through the gospel. Let me ask you, if we have an immortal soul, then what is that, how does it make sense that Jesus is going to bring immortality through the gospel. If we are already immortal, is it good news that Jesus has brought immortality? No, it's not good news because we already are immortal. However, the Bible says that the good news of the gospel is that although you and I have sinned, you and I can receive the gift of eternal life once again. Interestingly, even the Catholic Encyclopedia in its former editions actually admitted that the soul in the Old Testament means not a part of man, but the whole man as a living be. Similarly, in the New Testament, it signifies human life, the life of an individu individual conscious object. That's amazing. That is amazing. <coughs> I want you to see something very incredible. What is it that the Catholic Encyclopedia is arguing from? It argues from the Old Testament and the New Testament. But when you read the Catechism, they say something else. Why? Because they say tradition teaches us something else. So they are fully aware what the Bible teaches about what the Bible says about the soul. But they say we believe also in tradition. So that is really, really remarkable. The Catholic Encyclopedia continues that Bible scholars have maintained 
that the New Testament does not teach the immortality of the soul in the Hellenistic, that is the Greek uh, philosophy of an immortal principle after death. So what is the Roman Catholic Church saying? That the Bible does not teach immortality of the soul. That's amazing. That is really incredible. Let me ask you this. If people already have immortality, then Jesus' death on the cross becomes unnecessary and even illogical because God gives us something that we already have. What is that? Eternal life. If you and I already possess immortality, then the gospel is not good news. Because the gospel is that when you have sinned, you have separated yourself from God. And you are mortal. You are mortal. Take a look at this. In John, 1 John, chapter 3, verse 5, the Bible says something interesting here. In 1 John, chapter 3, verse 15, the Bible says, Whoever hates his brother, is there anyone who hates his brother here? Don't raise your hand. Okay. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. What does the Bible say here? That we do not have immortality. And if we break the commandments of God, we are without Jesus. We are without the source of eternal life. Let me once again put this forward to you. If people already have immortality, then Jesus' death on the cross becomes unnecessary and even illogical because God gives us something that we already have. Does that make sense? So what does the Bible teach about the state of man in death? Are we to follow the pharaohs and the Egyptian civilization? Or are we to follow what the Bible says about this issue? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5, it is just after the book of Proverbs, the Bible says, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. I just want this verse to be, uh, to be read in the different languages so people can see that. So, so what does the Bible say about the dead? How much do the dead know? They know nothing. <laughs> the Bible says that when someone dies, that person is unconscious of what is taking place. Verse 6, the Bible says, Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And if we read verse 10, the Bible says, Whatever your hand finds to do, 
do it with your mind. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So let me ask you, the people who have died, how much do they know? Are they aware of what is taking place on planet Earth right now? What does the Bible say? What has done? Their love, their hatred, their envy, even their thoughts have perished. They are unconscious of what is taking place. What, where are the dead? That's the big question, right? The Bible says in John chapter 5, let's go to John. John chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 28 and 29. Who is speaking here? Jesus. Do you accept the words of Jesus? <coughs> the Bible says, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice, bless you, and come forth, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. What does the Bible say? Is Jesus saying that they are in heaven? No. Jesus simply says that they have returned to the graves, they are waiting for the resurrection, and when the resurrection takes place, they are going to be resurrected. Even Daniel chapter 12 verse, not, verse 2 says, and many of those who do what? I, I love that word. Sleep. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. What do you say? Do you find a hope in this message? That even though some may have died, but if they have faith in Jesus Christ, they will awake when Jesus will come back? Isn't this a message of hope? Isn't this a message which should go to the ends of the world? That there is hope beyond the grave. Grave is not the end. Grave is not the last station. Grave will have not the last laugh, but Jesus will, because Jesus has defeated death on the cross. Sleep in the dust of the earth. They shall away. Some to everlasting life, some to shame, and everlasting contentment. It's yours and mine choice which resurrection we want to be in. If that would happen, if we would die before Jesus would come back. But scripture says that when someone dies, they are sleeping. They are sleeping. They are unconscious. In the book of Psalms, chapter 13 and verse 13, the Bible says it clearly what death is. The Bible says, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So according to the authors of both the Old and the New Testament, as we will see soon, the death is what? Is nothing else than sleep. Do you like to sleep? I like to sleep. You know, when I was playing a professional football, I broke my leg. 
And it, it was it was not a good sight, I must tell you. The bones were sticking out, there was blood all over the place. It's not good for the faint-hearted. But I was taken to the hospital. And you know what they do when they take someone to the hospital and they're going to do some surgery? What is it that they receive? Yes. And what is that which helps you before the surgery? It will help you sleep like a baby. Now let me tell you, when I was having that surgery, I received that and I was sleeping like a baby. And you know, that was an several hours long surgery. But when I, and you know what I wanted to do? I said, I'm going to fight. I'm not going to sleep. So every time, you know, my eyelids were, I opened them up. But you know, the, 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 it is so powerful that after a while, whether you like it or not, you're going to sleep. So there I was on the surgery table and I fell asleep. Now, do you think I was conscious of what was taking place around me? Not at all. As I was sleeping like a baby. And you know, it was incredible. Those of you who have had this experience know what I'm talking about. The moment I went to bed, so to speak, the next moment I woke up. It was an hours long wait for me. No, no. It, the next moment I woke up, I said, where am I? And then the nurses and the doctors, they told me, well, you are in this part of the hospital. Why? You had a surgery. Okay, it makes sense. The similar it is with death, my friends. When someone dies, that person, according to the Bible, sleeps. It is unconscious of what is taking place around it. And when Jesus comes, which will be the next thing for him or her to happen, there will be the resurrection. Just as it was with my surgery, so also it will be with death. Sleeping the sleep of death. In Job chapter 14, verse 12, the Bible says, So man lieth down and riseth not, till the heaven be no more. When will the heaven be no more? When Jesus comes back. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their, what is the word? Sleep. Do you see that in the Bible, sleep and death goes like this? When the Bible says they will not be raised out of their sleep, they are speaking about they will not be raised out of their death. Jesus said they will be coming forth from their graves. And this was our scripture reading in John chapter 11, in verses 11 to 14. And you know, if there is any verse, if there is any Bible passage, which I believe gives a full explanation of what the Bible says about death, then it's this. Do you believe in Jesus? <laughs> if you believe in Jesus and you find the words of Jesus authoritative, you will see what, how Jesus viewed death. Jesus said in John 11, and he speaks about Lazarus. The Bible says, Jesus said, and after that, he said to the disciples, our friend Lazarus, what is the word? Sleeps. Was Lazarus sleeping? He was dead. And that's what the disciples misunderstood. Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. 
Do you do, do you like the disciples? That are, Jesus, what are you talking about here? However, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is what? Dead. So when Jesus says that Lazarus sleeps and that Lazarus is dead, what is he saying? That sleeping and death is that same thing. When the Bible speaks about death, it uses the metaphor of sleep. The Bible does not say when someone dies, they go to heaven. The Bible simply says they are sleeping. The, the body goes back to the dust and the spirit, that character which each one of us have received and developed, that goes back to God. Now, you know what is so interesting? When you read John chapter 11, you are going to find that Lazarus comes back because Jesus resurrected him. Now, let me ask you, does the Bible say something that Lazarus said about death? The answer is no. Lazarus does not say, Jesus, I had such a good time with the angels. I had such a good time with Abraham. I had such a good time with all the saints. Does Lazarus say that in John 11? No. Why? Because Lazarus was not in heaven. Lazarus was simply sleeping. Imagine this. Imagine this. You are in heaven. You have died and you are in heaven directly. You are enjoying the glories of heaven. A life without sin. A life without death. A life without misery. A life without waking up uh, six o'clock on Mondays. Hello, somebody. You are enjoying heaven, but somehow Jesus calls you back to earth. Would you like that? You are enjoying heaven and now someone is calling you back to once again experience sin and experience evil and suffering on planet earth. I don't think that that is really that uh, gracious, so to speak. Instead, Lazarus was simply sleeping and he came forth from the grave. Anybody recognizes the story that Jesus said to, to the people, remove the stone. Remember that? He just said, remove the stone. And what was it that Jesus said before Lazarus was raised? He said, Lazarus, come forth. You know why it's important that Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth? You know why it's important that Jesus said the name first and then said, come forth? Because if Jesus would only have said, come forth, all of the graves would have opened up. But now he said, Lazarus, and only Lazarus came forth. That's one of the major, major miracles which Jesus made on planet Earth, which testifies that if Jesus was able to resurrect Lazarus from the dead, he is able to resurrect each one of us if we would sleep in Jesus when he comes back. How much do the dead know? Nothing the Bible says. They are simply sleeping. The Bible says the dead know not anything. The Bible says in Psalms 115, the dead praise not the Lord. Now let me ask you, if the dead are truly conscious and they are in heaven, wouldn't they worship God? What are the angels, according to the book of Revelation, what are the angels doing in heaven? They are glorifying and worshiping and praising God. Yet the Bible says the dead do not praise the Lord. Why? Because they are unconscious. They are not aware. 
of their existence. The Bible even says that the dead do not even remember God. I mean, the, the scriptures are so clear. And even their thoughts perish. Even their thoughts perish. So when do we receive immortality then? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm reading verses 51 and 55. These are the words of Paul. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 55, Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. He says, We shall not all sleep. What is he meaning by sleep? He means death. He says, We shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, it's not Donald Trump, it's the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, what? Incorruptible, and we shall, and shall be changed. Listen to this. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and listen now, and this mortal must put on immortality. So does the Bible say that we are mortal? The answer is yes. And when Jesus comes back, He comes with the gift of immortality and He gives it to everyone who has chosen to believe in Him. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that He has died for your sins? Do you believe that? Right now, you can have full confidence that if you have received Jesus Christ, that He will give you the gift of immortality. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, For the Lord Jesus Christ Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen? What a hope! What a hope we have that if we have accepted Christ, He who has defeated death, He will also defeat death in our own lives. Did you know that in the original Greek, as it is rightly translated in the Folkbibel in the Swedish, it actually says that those who are sleeping in Christ, which simply means they are sleeping until the resurrection. The Bible continues, then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up together with them in the clouds. You know how beautiful that picture is? Is there someone who you know who has passed away? Is there someone in your life who was close to you has passed away? The Bible says that God will send all the angels and as Jesus is coming back, those who have, those who have passed away, when they are going to resurrect, the angels are going to bring families together, which by death they were separated. At the resurrection, when Jesus comes back, the families are going to be united for how long? Forever. Amen? When Jesus comes, they will be set, united and they together, they're going to be caught up and they will be taken to heaven. Isn't that wonderful? Do you like the imagery the Bible says? To meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Bible simply teaches that death is a quiet rest. You don't have to be afraid of death. You don't have to fear death because Jesus has defeated 
death. What did the serpent say in the Garden of Eden? Remember in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent said to Eve, you will not surely die. What did God say? God said to Adam, as it comes to every tree in the garden, you can eat how much you eat, whenever you want to eat it, how long you want to eat it, but from one tree, do not eat of it, because the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So here God says, the day you are going to transgress my commandments, you are going to die. But then the serpent says, you shall not surely die. The serpent says, no, 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 you will continue to exist. You will continue to live. Who is right? Is God right? Who says, the day you eat, you will become mortal? Or is it the serpent who says, no, you will continue to live. You will continue to exist. Who lied? Because someone is lying. Only one is telling the truth. You see, if the soul is immortal, then the devil did not lie. I want that to sink in. If the soul is immortal, then when the serpent says, you will not surely die, he's actually saying the truth. And whenever you are looking at the ancient religions, whether that is the Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Greek, the Roman, even Buddhism and Islam, not to speak about Freemasonry and all occult societies, they believe in the immortality of the soul. Satanic priests and Satanism also believe in the pagan doctrine of the immortality of the soul. And my friends, do you know what is so discouraging? <laughs> it is that this lie is also being taught in so many other churches. The lie of the immortality of the soul is unfortunately rampant in many, many churches in Christianity, which is being taught over and over and over again. I do not judge them. Please do not misunderstand me. I do not judge them. What I'm, all, what I'm saying is, this is not what Scripture says. What is spiritualism as we are ending? Well, remember, spiritualism says that the dead know more than the living. And the serpent said, you shall not surely die. However, the Bible says that the dead know not anything. So is the Bible true or is spiritualism true? This is a spiritualist by the name of Spray. He said, in this, as in many other Bible passages, the devil told the truth and the Lord is in error. Let that sink in, because we are speaking about serious things. You shall surely die, or you will not surely die. The Satanists and the spiritualists say, Satan told the truth, God told the lie. You see, spiritualism is the belief or the doctrine that the spirits of the dead communicate with the living 
especially through mediums. And you know what I find so remarkable? That in the Anglican Church, churches should hold seances. You know what a seance is? A seance is a time when a group of people come together and there is a medium who is communicating with the spirit world and that is communicating with the people. And the people can ask this medium certain questions and the medium is asking the question the, the certain spirits who are none other than demons or fallen angels. Churches are holding seances, communicating with demons. Do you understand why the book of Revelation chapter 18 says that Babylon has become a habitation of devils? were none other than demons. Hollywood. I wish we could have more time to go into Hollywood, but you see, Hollywood has become the platform of communicating the religion of spiritualism to people and indoctrinating them into the lie which the devil told in the very beginning. Holly. You know where, what the word Holly comes from? <coughs> Holly comes, you see the spiritualists and these magicians and, and what have you, these witchcrafts, what, they were using a special kind of substance in order to be able to do whatever they were going to do. Now that substance was called Holly. Isn't that interesting that Harry Potter's uh, what, what do you call that? A womb? It's anybody knows the name of it? It comes from the tree. Holly. Holly wood. Doesn't that make you some questions? Holly wood. The Revelation 18, verse 23 says, For by thy sorceries were all the nations deceived. The word for sorcery here comes from the word pharmakeia and it can also be translated as witchcraft. For by your witchcraft the nations were deceived. Are the nations today deceived by witchcraft? Oh yes. Are the western part of the world also being deceived by witchcraft? Yes. Maybe not in the same thing as perhaps in Africa, or in Asia, or in South America. But witchcraft is fully embedded in the western part of the world. How? Through entertainment. Entertainment television, entertainment series. You see, it was in the 1990s that this revival of spiritualism, of making spiritualism uh, acceptable in the public, really came forth by some of the TV series I bet you watched, because I watched them too. So whether that is Sabrina, hello somebody, or Charmed, or Practical Magic by Sandra Bullock or Vampire Slayer, they are trying to make this as acceptable to the public and indoctrinating them as much as possible. And if there is any movie that has played a significant role in making spiritualism a cool thing, making spiritualism 
a thing you have to do. It is the movie Harry Potter. It is the communication of the spirit world. And you see, whether that is New Age, reincarnation, ESP, magic, occultism, astrology, witchcraft, Satanism, they are all being come to the forefront through the entertainment industry. And you see, whether that is Harry Potter or even the movie Twilight, it doesn't matter. It reaches many people. You see, this house that you are able to see here, in the 1840s, it is the same moment when God raises up the Advent movement. It is that same time period. God is going to begin a movement to preach the three angels' messages to the world. And at that same time, in the 1840s, a new philosophy, not new for that matter, but a philosophy is now going to be founded by the Fox's sisters. How many of you have heard of the Fox's sisters? Now the Fox's sisters were living in a house. And this house was, well, people in the world are using haunted, it was demon possessed, all right? These sisters, the Fox's sisters, they were ex experiencing supernatural events in this house. They were hearing knocks, but no one was there. They were hearing footsteps, but there was no one there. And the sisters were afraid. And you know what the sisters did? One of them, the sisters took communication with these spirits. When they knocked, they responded to the spirit communication. And they, the spirits, revealed themselves to the Fox's sisters, and the Fox's, and, and, and they said, we are all your dead relatives and friends. What does the Bible say? What are the dead relatives doing right now? Are sleeping. Who were the ones that revealed themselves? It was none other than demons, fallen angels, masquerading as dead relatives. They opened the door to the devil's door. The Bible says in Revelation 16, for they are the spirit of devils working miracles. You see, these familiar spirits, they are not the spirits of the dead. They are evil angels. They are messengers of Satan. And this is a true tombstone that you are seeing here. The place where they were, the very house in which spiritualism began, in the modern era, so to speak, this is the birthplace of modern spiritualism. Upon this site stood the Hydesville Cottage, the home of the Fox's sisters through whose mediumship communication with the spirit world was established in 1848. And remarkably on the tombstone, what, they, what are they saying? There is no death. There are no death. Thou shalt surely die, or thou shalt not surely die. So spiritualism is just a continuation of the first lie the devil told in the Garden of Eden. So in 1840, God brings about the Advent movement 
to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. In the 1840s, Satan brings about a movement of spiritualism to deceive the entire world. Can you see the great controversy before your eyes? The controversy is real. The devil's door was wide open. You see, spiritualism claims that the dead are not dead. The fundamental principle of spiritualism is that human beings survive bodily death and that occasionally, under conditions not yet fully understood, we can communicate with those who have gone before. Is it biblical or is it not biblical? This is satanic. The spiritualism claims the dead communicate with the living. As we saw, there is no death in the graveyard. I have frequent talks with the dead. I cannot doubt that people live after death, for I frequently talk with them. Sir Oliver Lodge. And I bet you that there are thousands, if not millions of people who are talking with these supposed spirits of the dead. Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton, but that's another presentation. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. You know, Jesus said, and this is where we are ending, in John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, the Bible says what kind of hope you and I have. The Bible says in John chapter 11 verse 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And my question to you is, do you believe this? Martin Luther, one of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation said, who also believed what we now have studied, he says, we shall sleep until he comes and knocks on the little grave and says, Dr. Martin, get up. Then I shall rise in a moment and be with him forever. Isn't that beautiful? Dr. Martin, get up. And that's what he's saying for everyone who are sleeping in Jesus Christ. Get up. Enjoy eternal life with me. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus has defeated death? Do you believe that Jesus is able to give you the gift of immortality? Do you believe that if we humble ourselves, we give our sins to Jesus and He cleanses us from sin, that you are now able to fully enjoy eternal life and that when Jesus comes back in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment, this mortal body will be changed into an immortal body and that we will be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. Do you believe this? If this is your will and if this is your desire and you say, Jesus, I am not afraid of death anymore. I have realized that death is nothing else than asleep. If this is your wish and you say, Jesus, I want to give my life to you. Jesus, I want you to be in my heart. Jesus, I want you to be in my life. If this is your wish, would you like to please stand with me as a sign of decision before Christ?
that you say, Lord, I'm not afraid of death. You have defeated death. I want to give everything to you. Please understand that as you stand, Christ stands next to you. And that's the message that we will be with Him forever. Let us pray. Father in heaven, what a privilege and what a joy it is to know what the Bible says about this important topic. I ask you, Lord, in a special way for everyone in this room that we may all humble ourselves before you and give our sins to you. And I ask you, Lord, cleanse us from everything that is against your law and may the Holy Spirit dwell in our hearts. Help us to live with the notion that already now we can have eternal life and that when you will come that gift of immortality will become a reality and we will be with you forever and ever and death and sin and nothing else will not exist except you and your love and your peace. In Jesus' name, I thank you and praise you. Amen.